Today, our program is on family dynamics or better. We are so delighted to have Dr. David Smith back with us. Dr. Smith has done a lot of programs with us. Very, very uh, important information that he has shared with us and very popular among all those that uh, tune into mmlearn.org. Uh, so th this topic is, uh, is quite interesting to me. I uh, am a family doctor by trade. I started out in a uh, rural practice in the, the infamous Deadwood, South Dakota. Uh, I have a thousand babies to my credit. Uh, that is delivering them. And um, uh, it wasn't until mid-career that I began to shift towards geriatrics. Uh, I taught medical school for the University of South Dakota for many years. And uh, they needed a geriatrician on staff to teach. Uh, so I, I gradually shifted my uh, work into that area. I have been the, uh, uh, a past president of the American Medical Directors Association, which is the um, organization of nursing home doctors for the nation. Uh, I have um, been involved particularly uh, with uh, dementia and with uh, psychiatric issues of the elderly. Uh, the issue of family dynamics and um, uh, non-professional caregiving or informal caregiving comes up virtually daily in my practice. And uh, while I didn't think that I had a body of knowledge about this, when I sat down to write the show, it turned out that it just flowed out really easy. So there uh, uh, as, uh, is a, um, uh, a body of knowledge on this that I wish to share with you today. And let's get into it. These, um, I didn't write these bullets. Uh, MM Learn uh, picked these uh, statements up from past programs or uh, others that have called into them. And so let me just uh, say that uh, they have heard comments such as, I'm overwhelmed and my sister won't help me at all. Is there anything I can do? My brother is in denial. He doesn't want to believe that mother is in decline or that she is even showing signs of dementia. My sister wants to make all the decisions and I don't always agree with the decisions she makes. I think my brother is stealing or hurting or verbally abusing my mother. My siblings are sabotaging my attempts at caregiving. My parents didn't take care of me but I feel that I need to care for them. This is a difficult transition for me. So what are the skills that are necessary for the child of aging parents? I uh, boiled these down to three. First, uh, we need to be able to recognize functional and or cognitive decline. We need to be psychosocially ready for the reversal of roles from, parent, uh, from child uh, to virtually being a parent for our aging um, uh, parent. And we need to know the uh, options for surrogate decision making and know when to apply uh, each of them. So let's break these down. Let's do, take them on one at a time. Uh, how do you eat an elephant? One bite at a time. Recognizing functional or uh, cognitive decline. Depending on where a, an elder is in the structure of the family, their dominance uh, within the family, uh, their past history, uh, the, the more grand they are, the more dominant they are, the more difficult it is for us to shift our mind to recognize that they are failing. Uh, there have actually been uh, presidents and vice presidents of big companies that have developed dementia and have virtually offloaded all of their job description to subordinates. So they're basically just sitting around in the office all day and because they have a history of uh, being a grand leader, uh, their dementia isn't recognized until something horrible happens in that company. Uh, this happens in families too, and um, uh, so we need to be cognizant of this and actually actively look for some of the signs that a, a person is, is uh, having either functional or cognitive failure in their life. They may defer to others. They may gradually start to shift uh, their responsibilities to someone else. If the, uh, they do this, it's oftentimes with, a, with their spouse. And uh, if that's not characteristic of uh, the family dynamics, then it, it uh, may stick out like a sore thumb. But if dad has always kind of relied on mom, 
uh, then the fact that that shift shifts even more uh, may be hard to recognize. We may find the elder asking for help uh, for things that they care and didn't characteristically ask for help before. Uh, or, sadly, they may not ask for help and then start making mistakes so that bills don't get paid, uh, the taxes don't get done right, this, that, or the other thing. You may pick up on a change in hygiene, and that could be either their personal hygiene, not being as well kempt as they otherwise were, or a change in the home environment. The home gets messier, uh, the yard work doesn't get done, something like this would connote a, um, uh, or signal a decline in the person's function or their cognitive ability. Falls occur, and uh, elders tend to hide the fact that they fall. This is one of uh, many hidden symptoms in geriatrics. Uh, so you need to be alert to bruises and injuries and, and such that uh, uh, the elder may have hidden the event from you. Getting lost uh, should be a, a big red flag, and one that so often comes up is poor driving skills. You don't want to be in denial. Uh, as I said, the, the more power, the more dignity, the more uh, grand uh, a, an individual is within their family structure, the, the more difficult it is for you to recognize that this person is failing. Uh, and when you do recognize that, it's also just hard to believe it. It's something you don't want to believe, and it's easy to be in denial. You also don't want to be buffaloed because elders who are failing may very well recognize their own deficits. And if they do, they'll tend to hide them in most cases. It's not good for one's ego to say, I'm losing it. And so they'll tend to hide that. People that have very good social skills will always come up for, with an excuse for why they missed an appointment, uh, why something didn't get done. Uh, and uh, it's, it's easy for us to accept that. Uh, but don't be buffaloed because it is a warning sign. I wanted to throw in a slide here about competence and mental capacity uh, because this really cuts to the chase and it oftentimes doesn't get massaged, doesn't get handled. Uh, and it's kind of square one. It's kind of like the first thing that needs to happen in your mind to determine whether somebody is their own boss or whether somebody else needs to take over and, and be responsible for that person's decisions in um, either personal or medical or financial uh, decision making. Competence is a legal term. Uh, whether you're competent or incompetent needs to be determined by a judge, by a court. Capacity or mental incapacity is actually a clinical decision that is uh, made by one's doctor or other mental health professional. Now, a court does use the, de the determination of a mental health professional doctor uh, that, that someone is mentally incapacitated in order to adjudicate the, the competency or incompetency, but there is a difference between the two, and competence is a legal determination. Now, it's an axiom of Judeo-Christian law uh, that everybody is competent until a court adjudicates them otherwise. So um, uh, recognize this, that if we don't deal with this problem and the person enters into a contract for aluminum siding or for this, that, or the other thing, and it was a really bad decision, and that bad decision came out of mental incapacity that was not recognized, not recorded, not formalized, then that contract needs to stand even though it's a really bad contract for the, for the elder or for uh, their, um, their family. So that's one of the reasons this needs to be dealt with up front. There are also different um, rules or, or criteria for different kinds of capacity. Uh, just to, to go over a little bit of that, not beat it to, to death, but in order to commit a crime or to stand trial, uh, one needs to be competent to stand trial, and the, the rules for that are two. One needs to know the difference between right and wrong, and they need to be able to participate in their own defense. Think about it, that's actually quite a low standard, so that many of the things that happen uh, to an individual who is mentally ill, 
uh, uh, mentally retarded or demented may still stand the test of being a crime. Another good reason to deal with this up front so that we can get it on paper that a person is not mentally capacitated, not competent uh, before some bad event occurs. Testamentary capacity is the uh, ability to make or change a will. And uh, wills are tough to break if they happen and they're on paper and then later on someone who gets cut out of the will says, well, mom or dad didn't know what they were doing. They were not in their own right mind. They were developing Alzheimer's. In order to have testamentary capacity, that also was a fairly low test. Uh, and it means that you need to know who your potential heirs are, not necessarily who you do give money to, but who are the array of people that we would expect a reasonable person to consider in terms of their will. Uh, the second and only other test of testamentary capacity is uh, to know the extent of one's bounty, to use the legal terminology. And that means, do they understand what wealth they have in proportion to the various things. They don't need to know right down to the dime what's in the bank account, but they have to have a general understanding of the value of things and uh, uh, what they have. I, I did get involved in one will that was contested and we did break it because this old gal had willed one of her sons uh, an antique car and had willed the other son a uh, 4,000 acre ranch now, and, and, and she is, had said that she intended to treat them equally, that she loved them both equally and she was trying to treat them equally. Well, there's no equality between this antique, antique car that was worth you know, a few thousand dollars and a ranch that's used at worth a few million dollars. So we were able in retrospect to say that she did not have testamentary capacity and the will was broken. Um, the, the tests for financial and medical and personal decision making are actually not codified in the law, uh, but um, as, a, as a physician it does this all the time, uh, and this is the way all docs that do capacity evaluations, what we consider is uh, remembered by the mnemonic JOMAC. J is for judgment. Sometimes we look at the decision at hand that's actually called the person's capacity into question. Uh, are they going into a nursing home? Are they not? Are they competent to make that decision? Are they looking at all the factors and weighing the risks and the benefits in the, in the context of their own value system and their own goals for themselves? Um, are they aware of the consequences of the various array of, of decisions that they might make? Uh, another way that I sometimes test judgment is to ask people um, to solve a hypothetical judgment question, like what would you do if you're the first person in a crowded movie theater to notice that the place has caught fire? If the individual cannot give me an answer, that means that they're going to not cause a panic. They're going to try to get an orderly exit from the theater, then I consider that bad judgment. I did have one guy that said he would walk calmly to the exit door and turn around and yell fire. I did give him full credit for judgment, although he uh, was an evil person. Uh, the O is uh, for orientation. People need to be oriented to person, not only themselves, but other, who other people are. They need to have um, an orientation to um, a place, where are they, and to time. Uh, M stands for memory, and that can be both recent and remote memory. A is for the ability to think in the abstract, uh, to be able to think deeper than the surface. When I test this um, in, in a patient, I will ask them to tell me the background meaning, the philosophical meaning, the underlying meaning of a, of a familiar proverb. We try to use a proverb that they'd heard before, so we're not making them answer the question cold. So what does it mean? that a rolling stone gathers no moss. And if they tell you that, well, it means if a rock rolls down the hill, it doesn't get dirty because the dirt doesn't stick to it. Well, that's not a good answer. We do have to be a little careful about abstract uh, thinking because low educational level uh, historically will also match up with the inability to think deeply into problems. 
And so we not only look at what is their ability to think in the abstract, but what has it been throughout their life. Uh, so if there's a change in old age, we would consider this a flaw in their capacity. And C is the ability to calculate. Can they do simple mathematics? When a person makes their own decisions, uh, one of the, the principle of medical ethics uh, that we go by is that of autonomy. Uh, a person in our society has, has ownership of their own decisions over their own body, their own self, their own life. That's autonomy. But autonomy is not uh, necessarily set in stone for all time because if a person loses capacity, you might not be able to exercise autonomy for yourself. Uh, similarly, at the other end of the life spectrum, children are not allowed autonomy. If uh, Jimmy doesn't want his measles shot, mom takes him into the doctor, and Jimmy says, no, no, I don't want the measles shot. Well, mom says, yes, you're going to get it, and we get uh, three goons uh, uh, or nurses to come and hold Johnny while he, while he gets his uh, measles shot. He's a, he's a minor. He doesn't have the capacity to make the proper decision that a measles shot is good for him, even though it's going to hurt a little bit when we do it. And so he doesn't exercise his own autonomy, his, his autonomy. He actually has the same rights as you or I, but his mom is in charge of those. In late life and when people get dementia and lose mental capacity, they still have autonomy, but their autonomy is no longer exercised by them themselves, but needs to be exercised by someone else. And we're going to talk about surrogacy in a little bit. Beneficence is often forgot about in medical ethics, but beneficence uh, doesn't mean paternalism. It doesn't mean the doctor or the family is uh, just doing what they want. But we do need to recognize that it is important and a responsibility of the physician, the nurse, uh, the family to do what is right for a person who cannot think uh, accurately for themselves. And then justice is the principle of medical ethics that takes into account what's right for society. It's not just what's right for the individual. It also is what's right for society at large. And so if somebody has tuberculosis and they're mentally incapacitated to uh, prevent the spread of that tuberculosis to other people, then it would be by this uh, medical ethic principle, uh, the responsibility of caregivers to make something happen uh, so that the, that the public is protected uh, and the TB is not communicated to others. Just going back at those uh, statements that uh, M.M. Learn has heard from, or questions that they've heard from uh, uh, contributors, uh, if we just look at these, embedded in several of these is the issue of capacity. Uh, but it wasn't dealt with up front. Uh, in fact, the cart was before the horse. Uh, if we uh, consider, I'm overwhelmed, my sister won't help me, is there anything I can do? Why isn't mom or dad doing it themselves? Why are not they responsible to do it? Well, the answer is they're not mentally capacitated. But did we ever really formally determine that? Uh, one that's down here a little ways, I think my brother is stealing, hurting, verbally abusing my mom. I've had a number of uh, adult protective services cases where I've been asked to consult and where the issue was that uh, the, the, the elderly person was giving a whole bunch of their money to just one of their kids who still lived at the home. The other kids are worried that the, that the mother's wealth is going away. They're not going to get an inheritance. Or they're appropriately worried that mom's going to give it all away to this uh, ne'er-do-well daughter that's living with her. And she's not going to have enough to take care of herself for the rest of her life. Well, well the issue is... Is she mentally capacitated to do that? Because if she is mentally capacitated, then she is able to make mistakes. Capacitated people are allowed to make mistakes. Capacitated people are allowed to use bad judgment. Some people exercise that right throughout their entire life. But, and, and, it, and it isn't the government's or some other family members or a doctor's right to step in and and to force uh, a better decision. A good decision is what that person wanted. It's a free country. 
But if the person is not mentally capacitated, this becomes elder abuse and is uh, at least a misdemeanor, if not uh, a felony, if it is actually physical abuse. Um, well, let's, let's move on from there. The second of the skills necessary for the child of an aging parent is psychological and sociological readiness for a reversal of the roles uh, from being the child to being the parent. Uh, many uh, parents will uh, provide some resistance to this. They're, they're not in accepting their own uh, deficits. They're in denial uh, or they want to hide it. It's not good for their ego, so they want to bury this deficit uh, and they resist uh, this change. Others have the exact opposite response uh, to the role reversal and will just let the, it's easier for them, uh, it's, it's, it's comforting for them, and so they'll let the adult daughter take over, and they actually may let them take over more than they uh, have deficits to do, so that they develop more helplessness than they actually uh, ha have. And that, you know, if we, if we don't constantly practice uh, our skills in life, we lose them. If you don't use it, you lose it. So learned helplessness is a bad thing, and it actually promotes the deterioration of the person beyond the, the level of disability uh, and cognitive loss that they would otherwise have. Resentment can occur whether you have learned helplessness or resistance. In either case, the, the elder may be angry with the child for taking over uh, their autonomy. But in all of this, we need to recognize and lower our guilt cool our jets because beneficence, that medical ethic again, tells us that doing what's needed is the right thing. Another of the skills of the aging parent is knowledge of the options for surrogate decision making and when to use them. We've already talked about capacity and competence. Uh, advanced directives are um, can be a living will or they can be a power of attorney. I actually encourage people to make both of them. The living will becomes kind of your philosophy about how you'd like things to go if and when you're not uh, mentally capacitated to make your own decisions up front. The POA names a person to stand in for you and voice your wishes, and the POA can refer to the living will as, uh, as a background um, uh, script for how they are supposed to make decisions on behalf of of their ward, and I'll start using that word ward now. Uh, allow, this allows autonomy to go forward uh, even after one has developed incapacity. So think about it for yourself. If you want things, want decisions to be made the way you want them to be made, you need to exercise these kinds of, of documents so that your wishes will be carried forward and they won't be um, uh, your decisions won't be made by someone else in the context of their values and goals. There's a, a Texas Family Medical Decision Making Act. I'm not sure if that's exactly the right name for this law. Uh, and this kind of a law exists in many, many states. So that without going through all the tink tank tunk of a court hearing and guardianship, a person who develops incapacity in an old age or because of injury, brain damage, and so forth, that a family member can step forward in a hierarchy of people that are named in the law, starting with one's spouse, then a parent, uh, then, uh, a sim uh, then your uh, uh, adult children uh, in the uh, uh, hierarchy of their ages and so forth. There's a little statement in there, kind of a, an escape hatch that says that this person has to be the person who is reasonably available. So if the highest level person on the list is somebody that lives in Timbuktu, but somebody else that's a little lower on the list lives in the same town, they can step forward as the legally recognized surrogate decision maker without ever having to go through court or guardianships or any of that kind of thing. I did want to mention that POAs come in several different types. Uh, there you can do just a specific POA, usually not something that we do in medicine, 
But if, if I needed to uh, uh, do a contract and sign a contract out in California, but I couldn't be there, I had competing uh, obligations, I could have someone else be my power of attorney to go out there and sign that contract for a specific thing. A springing power of attorney, and this is what I'll probably write for myself because I'm kind of a controlling person, uh, is, is a, I'm going to name a power of attorney, I did name a power of attorney, uh, one of my daughters, to be my decision maker in the case that I become incapacitated, but it doesn't go into effect until I become mentally incapacitated. The one that mostly gets uh, uh, written in st Texas right now is a durable power of attorney, in which case a competent elder, a capacitated elder, <coughs> will um, name a person who is able to make their decisions officially for them, starting now, even before they lose capacity, and that will endure even after they lose capacity. Uh, you, they're, they're all legal documents. You can do whatever you want, but you, un, you understand the difference here. And personally, I like the springing one because I'm going to make my own decisions until I can't. Conservatorship and guardianship are, again, court proceedings uh, that uh, uh, require uh, the, the uh, action of a judge. Surrogate decision-making uh, should be considered substituted autonomy for the ward and not taking the place of decision-making for the ward. So you, you need to decide it's your obligation, morally and ethically, to make the decision as you understand they would have made it for themselves, not to do what you want to do. Uh, in the, the decisions then need to go forward with you being the surrogate decision-maker, but using the, the ward's framework of values, culture, religious, religious beliefs, self-concept, not your own. Uh, it's predicated, the whole concept is predicated on you, the family member, having an intimate knowledge of your ward's prior wishes. And in a, in a funny kind of way, I needed to, to show you that, that by doing it this way, it relieves you of a certain burden a moral b burden because it's not your choice. It's their substituted choice. So you should be relatively di uh, divorced from any guilt or any concern that you are somehow playing God. You are simply doing what they would have done if they were able to speak for themselves. Try to make decisions uh, using assent. Capacitated people, competent people, have consent. People who are incapacitated still have assent. That means they, ever, they either agree, Tommy agrees with the measles shot or he doesn't agree with the measles shot. If he agrees, that's assent. We like to try to gain the assent of an incapacitated or not competent person. So we would try to convince Tommy this is good for him and, and maybe things would go a lot smoother, uh, wouldn't have to have three goons hold him down. In the elder, we would generally try to get assent of an elder uh, when the decisions are minor or insignificant. So we really don't care if the ensemble that they put on that morning is uh, nicely color coordinated or if they have two plaids. The issue is they're covered up and they got to wear what they wanted to wear. Choose your battles. Uh, when differences between various choices uh, might be important, but the difference between the options is small. So are we going to have a heart operation or are we going to treat with medications? And you look at it and the survival between those two choices is fairly insignificant, then I probably would go with what the elder wanted even though they are uh, officially incompetent or mentally incapacitated. By doing that, we empower and respect our incapacitated ward to the greatest degree that we can, and we choose, again, choose our battles. Family decision-making. Uh, family interactions, the way families work together uh, to uh, deal with stresses and solve problems, is already set by life experiences and, and the process of being a family long before this caregiving issue is ever on the front burner. Those interactions, those, those patterns of interaction are very resistant to change. 
And they're not likely to change very much under stress. As a matter of fact, the effect of stress is to entrench family interactions patterns because they've always so, so for, uh, uh, they've always worked before. And so families are going to keep what they already know. Healthy families tend to adapt uh, to stressors while unfamily, unhealthy families become rigid or they become disorganized. Stressors uh, at hand usually include the physical demands of the caregiving itself, the emotional demands of the situation, prior family discord, the wars that are going on within the family, so to speak, financial issues, and then competing demands because now that we're adults, we all have our own lives to live. We've all got our own commitments, and uh, the stress becomes how are you going to do two things at once. As docs, we recognize that some families are set up for failures in this regard. Uh, they are pathological family systems. They're family systems that don't work. And some of the characteristics, not every family that's dysfunctional has the same pattern, but you're going to find one or more of these characteristics within a, fa a pathological family. Enmeshment means that people are too close. The family is too much of a unified uh, entity, uh, doesn't have the flexibility and the um, external support that it needs. It's, it's too tight, um, cult-like. Isolation of the family members from the rest of society, similarly, a cult-like kind of a, uh, of a family structure. Lack of privacy within the family. Everybody knows what everybody else is doing, knows the intimate details of their life. No privacy. Uh, again, this is, this is a characteristic of that enmeshment. Uh, lack of, and it, what it means is that these families are so tenuously strung together that they have to have these extraordinary rules in order to assure themselves that the family is okay. There's a lack of generational boundaries. There isn't a clear cut difference between the adults and the children. In many cases, there's hyper religiosity. Now, believe me, I'm not standing here telling you that faith is not a good thing. Faith is, a, is the, the only thing. It's, it's a wonderful thing. But religiosity is, is the tinkatank tunk. Uh, of, of religion and has nothing to do with faith and can many times be quite destructive. Uh, and the result, the end result of all these pathological dynamics is lack of conflict resolution. So in these families we see problems, stressors, issues that have been there for 20 years and they're still a festering sore and these people haven't fixed them because they don't have the tools. Common issues regarding the unequal yoke, uh, the, the, the family that isn't pulling together to solve the, the needs of a dependent elderly uh, parent. I don't have the time. I don't have the money. I just can't bear to see mom and dad that way. Uh, these are reverberating uh, comments that we've, we've heard over and over again. Let's take them one at a time. Uh, the time issue, they say they don't have the time. Does that mean that you do? Uh, caregiving oftentimes requires a major sacrifice uh, in time, and therefore, for the primary caregiver, it could, indicate, it could cause a sacrifice of job. I just learned today from Maria that there's a whole industry out there uh, in, in business looking at the decreased productivity of um, uh, the uh, worker who has aging parents. Other family obligations may be um, uh, set to the back burner so that mom doesn't get to go to Johnny's ball games, dad doesn't get to go to uh, the daughter's dance recitals because of the uh, demands of uh, caregiving. Uh, and obviously what uh, the deal is here is that you have to make the time for this or you're going to need to ante up uh, for professional help. That's oftentimes what the nursing home uh, or assisted living is all about, is the family that just can't do it uh, because their own lives require too much and uh, so they have to go a professional route. Another of the common issues is money. They don't have the money, but you do. You're rolling in dough. Um, with clarity, 
and with documentation, you need to understand that to the extent that your ward, your aging family member, your aging parent has finances, those are to be used up first. They should be spent down before you would ever dip into your own pocket. And if you did, it's not a legal obligation to do so. It would be out of your own goodwill. Uh, if and when the elder's uh, money is gone, you don't have that legal obligation. Uh, that's, that's not a principle of uh, a law in the United States. And the debts of the parents are, are not your debts. So you would go to Medicaid for medical stuff. Um, you would go to other programs for other stuff. Adult, adult children are not responsible. And as, and as a matter of fact, if we look at society's needs, the caregiving itself is a Herculean contrib contribution on your part. Uh, to the well-being of society and should be plenty for any of us to expect of you. Common issue, aversion to mom or dad's declining condition. They can't bear to see it, but you enjoy that? I, I don't think so. Uh, particularly the intimate things, uh, bathroom, bathing, peri care for an aging parent. Uh, you know, it's a taboo. We don't, we don't look at each other's private parts. Uh, in families, that's, that's just not done. And so this role reversal is, is uh, a major step in the dynamics of a family. Feeding, dressing, medications are also burdensome, but not so much as some of those intimate caregiving chores. Uh, coping with behavioral outbursts of a demented patient, now that does fall into the same kind of emotionally taxing uh, a task that uh, does the peri care and, and that. I need to make you aware that depression is common in caregivers. It's also common in demen dementia patients as a consequence of their disease process. And no matter where it originates, if it originates in the caregiver, there's about a 75-80% uh, coexistence of depression in their ward and vice versa. So depression is highly contagious uh, in this situation of of ward and informal caregiver. If we recognize that, we can um, nip it in the bud and we get a lot more success. The, uh, one of the keys here to solving this problem is requesting help. You need to ask directly, firmly, honestly of your siblings for their participation in handling this problem. Uh, you need to make that request as a demand. Not, it's not contingent. It's not, it's not a question. It's a demand. And it needs to have an action that you're telling them that you need them to do and consequences if they choose uh, not to participate. This is my Dr. Phil moment here. You don't ask directly. You forfeit your right to gripe for the all of eternity. So this is a key thing. Remedies for that unequal yoke, uh, there are other ways to do your fair share without money or, t or uh, uh, investment, uh, and it, with that, maybe without doing the direct caregiving, uh, particularly if, if uh, uh, the logistics of, of space and time aren't, you know, if, you, if, a, care if a, a family member lives in a distant place, they're not going to be able to do what the uh, uh, daughter who lives in the same town as mom uh, in our own family, my wife's mother is in her 90s. She's an assisted living up in Omaha, Nebraska. Uh, her, one, her younger daughter lives there yet. Uh, they're in the healthcare field too. She's a nurse, so she's got both the skills and uh, the, the, the uh, uh, geography uh, to be the, the major player in helping uh, uh, mom with her uh, needs as she uh, becomes physically and to some extent, uh, fortunately, a very mild extent, cognitively impaired. And we've talked about this, and, and actually being the distant people, uh, we initiated that conversation saying, just because of where we live, we're way down here in Texas, uh, uh, what you need to do is call us when there's something really big, and we'll try to come up, and we'll do uh, a, a greater share of it uh, at those times or we're going to try to pay you back in other ways. Some of the other ways you can do is share the, share of the caregiving might be the book work, uh, running errands, doing the yard work, if you were in the same town, 
doing something that the sibling needs done to offset what they're doing for mom. And uh, that has been one of the tactics that we have used uh, with my uh, uh, wife's sister and her husband is to say, let us do some things for you. Remedies for the unequal yoke um, uh, need to consider what the uh, siblings, family members' skills are. Uh, we are a healthcare family, so that's a, a no-brainer, but there might be other situations in where one family member was a, a, a health care provider. Others know nothing about that. So clearly, more of certain tasks are going to fall on that person who has already has those skills. And, and if that means that the caregiving, the donation of time and effort, is unequal between the two uh, siblings, then you need to plan for that and figure out ways to get around it to re-equalize it to, where, to the to the extent that's possible. Don't shoot for perfect equality, however. That's just not achievable uh, in most cases. But when it is unequal, agree upon that unequal inequality and reward it fairly for the person that's putting in the extra effort. Decide on this well before this becomes a way of life. If you let this get down the road a piece, and it's all way the all it's the way things have been going for the last four months, six months, a year, the chances that you're going to get a, an uninvolved sibling to all of a sudden change their ways and pitch in and do their fair share is fairly limited. Uh, they've got you over a barrel. So the time to do this is way up front when the problem first presents itself and we've got to sit down and we've got to decide how we are going to ha handle this family problem, this joint problem. Review the understanding from time to time when you have family get-togethers and so forth. And let me say that it actually is best to put this on paper with signatures. Do it as a informal contract so that there's a clear understanding uh, that uh, good fences make good neighbors. Remedies for the unequal yoke, cowboy up as we say in Texas, and tell others to do it too. This is what life has dealt it, dealt us. These are the cards we've got. We've got to play these cards. We don't get to reshuffle the deck and, and play a different hand. Consider equalizing the unequal effort by um, the sibling family member does something else for the caregivers. I've told you that. Uh, but it might also be true that the, the uninvolved family member in a distant place might actually pay. They're, I mean, if, they, if they, the daughter that lives in town loses, has to let go of her job and, and do this, then why can't the other sibling actually pay them a salary for doing that? And if they don't have the money, but if mom and dad do have money and there's going to be an inheritance, make a contract for an unequal distribution of the, of the inheritance. So often I see parents who have divided their inheritance equally among siblings and don't recognize that one individual or another uh, is doing a greater share. Up in uh, Nebraska, South Dakota, we would see this with the oldest boy who stays on the farm and continues to run the farm with dad. And as dad starts to lose it, isn't physically capable, the son takes over the entire uh, ranch or farming operation. They live in an old, um, in the original house, and dad and mom have built a nice new house. And, and uh, the son, who has foregone college and run the farm or run the ranch with dad, now gets an equal share of the farm when dad and mom die. And the kids that live in New York don't want to keep the farm. They want to sell it. Now this 50-year-old man who knows nothing else but this farm and has put his entire life in it only owns a fifth of the farm and the money is divided equally between the kids. Not good. Time to get that stuff straightened out is way ahead of time, and contracting for the inheritance is one way that can be done. When irreconcilable differences occur, and these are serious differences, then arbitrate. You might call in your clergyman. You might call in your doctor. If, you're in, if the elder is in a nursing home, the social worker at the nursing home is, is very equipped uh, to be an arbitrator of these kind of family differences. If all else fails, you may have to get a lawyer. If the uh, uh, other sibling is neglectful or is abusing financially or physically, 
uh, the aging parent, then that's time for adult protective services. Seeking guardianship as a last resort, if you need to give your, the rest of your family a divorce and take over and do what's right, you may need to go to court. If you do go to court and get a guardianship, be prepared. You'll have to do annual reports, but this protects you later on from insinuations from your other family members. Not responsible personally for the ward's expenses, and as a matter of fact, with the court oversight, you can actually pay yourself for the expenses of being a guardian, uh, trips to Austin, doing this, doing that. You can pay yourself from your loved one's estate. I've got some additional reading for you here, and we'll do Q&A. Do you as a doctor choose which child to listen to just because they seem uh, the most sane family member? Well, the answer is sometimes. Uh, because being a clinician, I, I can sometimes recognize that one family member or another uh, is um, not okay. But uh, I teach uh, young docs, of course, and one of the things I tell them is the trap of getting recruited by the first family member that talks to you, especially if that first family member that talks to you talks dirt about uh, other family members that are likely to come and talk. Oh, well, they're going to come and they're going to tell you this and tell you that and the other thing. Realize that you're getting worked. Now, they might be telling you the honest truth. They know that this is a black sheep of the family. Black sheep of the family. They're going to come in and try to get wealth out of this so they can do their drug thing, whatever. And and so you you got to listen and be, but you got to be unbiased and not let the first person that you talk to be the be. Uh, uh, recruit you to their way of thinking. The other uh, thing is that some people just psychologically go with the last person that they've talked to. Those are both traps. You've got to look at the material involved and sometimes you need to corroborate that uh, by going uh, to, to non-traditional ways in order to get information to find out who's telling me the truth and who's blowing smoke. Uh, adult protective services can be a good route there. Um, Physicians can make anon or sh should be making anonymous um, uh, complaints to APS for these investigations. Actually, you're not anonymous to APS. You tell them who you are, but an APS is not supposed to tell uh, the people that they are investigating who made the, uh, the contact. Um, thanks for making me feel understood in regard to role reversal. This is overwhelming. You bet it's overwhelming. Uh, particularly if your parent has been very dominant with you, um, appropriately or not appropriately, it, it's hard to make that shift. How would you recommend dealing not with a sibling but uh, with an aunt who is very close and does not agree with the decisions we make? Don't want to hurt her feelings, uh, but she is very insistent. Well, uh, of course, first of all, we need to ask her where she's com where is she coming from. Uh, what is it that, um, what, what does she think ought to happen and why? And uh, there may be either um, some useful information in there where there, you could go, her, maybe you'd find out that she changed your mind. Maybe you would find out that you can compromise, that there's wiggle room. Maybe you find out she's all wet and you can explain to her why she's all wet. So I would, I would deal with the facts there first. Uh, from a, an emotional standpoint, I would certainly start out by telling her how important her input is and that you want to keep hearing it, uh, but, in, but, but then lay down the law and say, but in the end, I'm mom's POA, and I need you to know that I'm making the decision the way mom told me to make it. We had these discussions, or she's got a living will. Um, again, by being preemptive in these we, we handle a lot of downstream problems. If our unhealthy family interactions have already been predetermined by the past, I almost feel doomed even if I am willing to change, but others are not. Yep, sorry. Um, now, maybe there's wiggle room here. Pathological families can uh, get help and have that see the light of day, but it'll take an arbitrator. It's unlikely that you can be the catalyst for change in a dysfunctional family. You're going to need to go to a professional, the doc, a clergyman, somebody else to help that family make fundamental change. 
And, and you need to get away from the issue at hand, because the issue at hand is a distraction for the real problem, which is the dysfunctional family. So you got to take, you got to get the, uh, the the other families and members to agree. We're going to take the decision, mom going to the nursing home or not, and we're going to set it over here. And the first thing we're going to do is figure out what's wrong with us. Why can't we work as a team? And then you're ready to tackle the other problem.